Hello friends, this is Sanjeev Kulkarni here. I am basically a polymer engineer with specialization in injection molding, injection mold design and development, flow analysis packages like Moldflow and Moldex. I am starting a new channel on uh, YouTube on the subject injection mold design and I will be presenting few presentations with technical literature. So this is, this presentation is the first in the series of the same. In this presentation we are going, we will understand the mold flow design principles. So overview of the presentation, in the first part we will understand how plastic fills a mold and in the second part we will understand mold flow design principles. Okay, let us understand how plastic fills a mold. Typically mold filling is divided in three stages. In the first stage, what you see in the screen, on the screen is a schematic diagram of an injection mold in a closed condition with injection screw barrel. So initially the required amount of polymer made is collected in front of a screw tip barrel. So as soon as you start moving the plunger or the screw, the polymer made start filling the cavity to nozzle and screw bush. So the movement of screw from this point to this point is primarily occurring during the filling stage. When the cavity is about just filled that is 94 to 98 percent due to viscoelastic nature of polymer met, the cavity is pressurized and if sufficient pressure is available to fill the rest of the cavity. So in this case what happens is the movement of the screw stops here and slowly it creeps till the com complete filling occurs. So this phase is called pressurization phase. Now what happens is as soon as the polymer melt comes in contact with cold walls of relatively cold walls of mold, the melt starts shrinking. So we need to compensate this volumetric shrinkage. So we continue to apply pressure till gates freeze. So this phase is called comp compensation phase. Let us understand what happens inside the cavity. So as the ram moves forward, it first moves at a steady speed as the plastic flows into the cavity. Please note the sketch, the shape of the polymer mid, polymer mid front is not straight here. It is parabolic in nature. This phase lasts until the mold is just filled about 94 to 90 percent. In the next pressurization phase, what happens is as soon as melt enters the cavity, a frozen layer is formed and inside which there is a hot melt available. So at just at the end of the filling phase, the mold is pressurized sufficient enough to fill the rest of the cavity on its own. At this point, the ram slows down but still moves some distance because of melt compressibility. In the compensation phase, you can see the frozen layer is thickening and uh, due to application of pressure on the polymer melt, the screw or ram continues to creep forward for some more time and the volumetric shrinkage that gets compensated 
by this application of the pressure. This phase is also called as holding phase or packing phase. Typically this term is these terms are used on the shop floor. Now let us understand mode flow design principles. The first one is unidirectional flow pattern, then flow balancing, constant pressure gradient, maximum shear stress, position weld and meld lines in the least sensitive areas. Avoid hesitation effects, avoid underflow, control frictional heating, thermal shutoff, and acceptable runner to cavity ratio. So, let us start with the first principle that is unidirectional flow. This principle says that the plastic should flow in one direction with a straight flow front throughout filling. Here you see the two scenarios. A simple central circular disc, in the first case it is gated in the center, so the flow front is omnidirectional. Whereas if you apply this principle, we have provided the gate on the side and you can see a uniform unidirectional flow pattern. Typically this flow pattern is required for transparent articles made of PMMA or polycarbonate. You get a very good optical properties with unidirectional flow. So this type of gate is used for making lenses, some transparent parts for automobile, automobile components. However, the flow length increases with this type of gating. Now the second principle that is of flow balancing. Here you can see this is the shape of the product and you have different choices. You can provide a gate here, here, here or here. But if you study closely the location D is the correct location as per this principle. This principle says that all the flow paths within a mold should feel at the same time and at the same pressure. So in if you provide a gate at location D, this flow path takes about 1 second, this flow path also takes 1 second. So both the flow fronts feel the cavity at the same time and the same pressure. So you will get the best results with this. Second example of flow balancing is shown on the screen now. There are two scenarios. It's a rectangular shape component, something like butter container with gate in the center. It could be a pinpoint gate or for a three plate mold or a hot tip bush. Here you can see typically we start with the uniform wall thickness of these components. But what happens because of the shorter path, this path feels first, then this path, then the longer path and finally the diagonal path. Now what happens in this such case? The shorter path, once it gets filled, the flow starts taking place in this direction. Similarly, after this part fills, the flow starts filling in this direction and you end up getting a weld line somewhere here. In scenario B, what we have done is we have balanced the flow by changing the wall thickness. These walls we have thinned down whereas we have thickened these two walls. In such case what happens is the more flow takes place along the length and less on the shorter side. So here you can see almost all the periphery get filled at the same time and at the same pressure. Typically this principle is used for luggage shells and other rectangular components which are gated in the center. 
like computer base or something like that. The third principle which is similar to or synonymous with first principle. The most efficient filling pattern is when the pressure gradient that is pressure drop per unit length is constant along the flow path. This situation occurs mostly when you apply the first principle. Maximum shear stress. See when polymer melts flow inside the mold, shear stresses are formed. Now every material has its particular property that it can withstand a certain value of shear stress because these shear stress are frozen at the end of feed or at the end of when you open the mold the shear stresses are frozen inside the component. Now if the shear stress values is more than the critical maximum value allowable for that particular comp material then either the part will warp or part will fail. It will reduce expected part life. So you have to ensure that maximum shear stress should always be below the particular value allowable for that particular material. Weld and mill lines. Typically in some cases weld, weld lines or mill lines are not available. So however this principle says that position weld and mill lines in the least sensitive areas. What you see on the screen is a typical box a lunch box with a live hinge or it can be a spectacle holder case with a live hinge. Now what the tool design has done is balance the flow in such a way that you get a weld line away from the hinge area. Next principle avoid hesitation effects. Typically this uh, situation occurs in most of the cases due to packaging of the uh, plastic components we have to change the wall thicknesses at certain regions and typically the thick section follow the thin or vice versa. So in such case suppose you provide a gate location at the junction of where thick section and thin section start then what happens is you can see in the first case the thick section start filling first and you see a heavy hesitation the polymer melt hesitates to flow in the thinner section. So this should be avoided. In the second case, if you provide, if you can provide a gate or location here, the thick section will easily get filled and you will get uniform uniform pattern. So this principle should always be remembered in mind while deciding the gate location. Avoid underflow. So typically one tends to provide more number of gate for large parts. Typically you know initially the mold designer consider A, B and C three gates for this component. Now if you see the flow pattern A and C gate number A and C are more dominant than B. So in such case what happens is on a primary position on the surface level you will not see any weld line. However the weld of the welding of the melt occurs at the core and this is not in the straight shape. So this weakens the complete structure and there is a tendency or there are chances of breaking these components. So in such case either a block get B or if, we, if, if it is a design stage then do not provide get B. Control friction and heating. The, the right hand sketch shows you that if you increase the melt temperature, the filling is, is easy and fast. Now, what happens is in such case, suppose you want to in, in inject the melt at 250 degrees centigrade, then you will have to heat the barrel at 250 degrees centigrade. However, if you design runners properly for controlled friction heating, that means you optimize the runner's dimension in such a way 
that due to velocity of the polymer melt, the kinetic energy will be converted into frictional heating, thereby locally increasing the temperature of the polymer melt as it enters the cavity. So this will have the same effect. However, your barrel temperature can still be at 230 degrees centigrade. Thereby, it will reduce the energy consumption and you will get better quality part. This also results in lowering the stress level without causing any degradation of the material. The last two, thermal shut off. So, you have to design the runner systems and the gate system in such a way that gates freeze off or shut off when the cavity just filled and adequately packed. Because once the gates are frozen, no matter how whatever pressure or how much time you apply packing pressure, it is not going to have any impact on the end result. The last principle, accept a runner to cavity ratio. Many times we have multiple cavity modes, 16 cavity, 32 cavity or 64 cavity, wherein we make small component with a um, multiple cavity mode. In such cases what happens is, the weight of the feed system is more than the weight of the products. So in such case, you design the runner system for the highest possible pressure drop to minimize the runner material. So typically, as a thumb rule, uh, you, you can afford 25 percent pressure drop in the runner system and 75 percent in the cavity. But that is general for a normal size of the components. However, in such case where you know we got 64 cavity or 32 cavity mode of small components, you can afford to go for a higher pressure drop in the runner system than in the cavities. So this principle is best suited for multi cavity mode. Summary, mode flow design principles are specific to the application. Application of one principle may affect the other. Choose the right kind of application or choose the right kind of principle for a specific application. Thank you. I hope you like my presentation. If you like it, please select the like button and please subscribe my channel. Thank you very much.